The funding for this video is provided by the amazing members of my Patreon. Also contributions from viewers like you. Thank you. Yeah, I started for PBS Kids. What you gonna do? Fight me? Anyway, roll the video. Hey, so before we get started, I have two announcements, of course. One, my book, me and my friend's book, Amaya Janelle, called mm, Do Not Call Me Sis. It is a collection of essays about fandom, massage noir, ableism, entertainment, and white feminism. You may laugh, you may cry. It's a pretty light read, only about 160, 50 pages long. We really would appreciate you guys go and check out our book. It will be available for purchase on my website on September 26, 2023 in a paperback, an audio book, and then also a digital ebook. So yeah, we're super duper excited. If you guys are looking to get more educated on any of these subjects about massage noir and ableism and white feminism, this is like a good starter guide to that. And you guys are also interested to know about like fandom and the good and the bad that has to do with that just as well and also some funny takes that we have about like certain types of media and whatnot we talk about everything we talk about brats we talk about barbie we talk about sam levinson we talk about thomas ashtruck we talk about star versus the forces of evil we talk about the teenage mutant ninja turtles it's so much nerdy shit up in this book so with that catches your interest we would deeply appreciate you guys check out our book and mind you if you get the digital copy it's gonna be signed <laughs> Okay, we love that. But second announcement, the wife who has is having a graduation ceremony. So they would most likely deeply appreciate it. You guys are able to donate. They really would be thankful. The link to that would be down below. And yeah, let's get into the rest of this video. Because what the fuck is this shit? <clears throat> When it comes to the subject of women and nerdy things, regardless of what region of the world it was created in, a name that often comes up is Ai Yazawa. If you don't know who she is, you may be familiar with her work as her series. Nana is one of the best-selling mangas worldwide and everyone's always fucking talking about it when the subject of women's stories and animation is present. And it's not even just women's stories and animation, it's just women and drawings in general. To sum it up, Nana is a much needed anime that describes the difficulties in women's lives and how to overcome them. We cheer on the two young women who are looking for themselves in lives and we meet and analyze how real each of their steps is. The finale assures us that although you may fulfill your dream and have everything, you may still not feel complete and lack someone to fill that part, for many such people are deceased or simply gone on the other side of life's path. There isn't much known about Ayazawa to the public, and the same can be said when it comes to many manga artists in general. We barely know much of anything about them, which is why things can become a bit murky when it comes to the problematic elements within their work. One of the few things we know about her is that she wasn't able to finish Nana as she became too sick to work on the series. This is something that often happens with manga artists as something similar happened to Koski, the creator of one of my favorite mangas of all time, Gangsta. You'd think that being a famous mangaka would lead to some serious money, but sadly that is untrue. Unless you're one of the big three creators, most manga artists are likely severely underpaid. When you consider the amount of work they put in, it's downright criminal. Remember, Manga is both a visual and written medium. That means you're not only creating an entire story by drawing it out as well. That takes an insane amount of work. You can't just create 100 plus chapters filled with dynamic panels from thin air. The work that goes into consumers, the creator. Most mangakas can't afford to hire an assistant artist or junior storyboard creators, so they all do the work by themselves. That includes initial sketching, inking, planning the story panels and placements, and then so on and so forth. It's insane to expect that all that can be done by one person on a monthly or even weekly deadline. And then after all that, they don't even get to see the fruits of their labor. Most of the money that they make from the release of the manga is kept to the publishing and distributing companies. The intense labor they put in doesn't yield similar results until many, many issues later. 
But guess what? We're not here to talk about Nana today, specifically because I never finished it because the pink Nana annoyed me too damn much to the point where I didn't even want to go back to it. We are here to talk about one of her lesser known stories, Neighborhood Story. Some of you may be familiar with its sequel, Paradise Kiss, which is much more popular than Neighborhood Story. I made a video about it a year ago. But why is Neighborhood Story so unknown, you may ask? Well, Neighborhood Story's manga was never adapted in English until this year, and as I'm making this video, the English manga is still not available for purchase. The anime adaptation of the manga, which was never adapted in English either. Yeah, you can watch it with the subtitles on, which isn't the problem. Despite Paradise Kiss being sacred and hollowed manga around the ground and sequel to the thing, Neighborhood Story had never got released in the United States. Hell, a 30 minute movie adaptation of this comic aired along a Dragon Ball Z film in theaters and yet the comic that made Ayazawa a household name amongst shoujo magazine stay unknown to English speaking audiences. The problem is that you can't stream it anywhere. Not on Netflix, Hulu, Amazon, Crunchyroll, Funimation, even Tubi. The only place that you can read the manga and watch the anime is on them stank ass anime sites with those kind of ads on them. As I watched and read Paradise Kiss, I had so many conflicting opinions and emotions about the series. So I wanted to know more. What happened in the story before? What is up with this world that the story takes place in? And let's just say I'm more conflicted now than I was before when it comes to Ayazawa's work. That conflict comes from the fact that I take inspiration from it, but there's so much about it that I don't particularly like. All right, oh Jesus, where do we even begin with this story? Now, I'm gonna have like a brief disclaimer I am trying to, you know, figure out how I still personally feel about Neighborhood Story overall. But mainly, I want every single last person that watches this video to take what I say about Neighborhood Story with a grain of salt. Because this is a series that is very much inaccessible. And just because you can get access to a series on one of them bootleg ass anime sites that we have it a hentai ads on the side, that doesn't mean it's accessible. Because a lot of people are hesitant on going to those websites because one, they don't want to see that shit. But two, those websites can put viruses on your devices. So one, I just want to make it clear that I am aware that this story is not accessible. Therefore, this is a lot of people's introduction to neighborhood story beyond just like the pretty ass pictures that they constantly see of it being shared around on Pinterest and Instagram and Twitter and all of that. That being said, while I want everybody to take what I say about the story with a grain of salt, I am not going to hold back on my opinions on how I feel about this. Because when it comes to the subject of Ayazawa and her work, she has done a lot in like the space of when it comes to women and manga and comics and animation in general because remember anime is animation it's just animation in japan what part of that don't y'all seem to get well i am very appreciative on what she has done and there is a lot of good with her stories there also is a lot of bad with them because this is something that i wish i was a little bit more vocal about in my video that i made about paradise kiss which i will have linked down below is that I really didn't like the way she handled Isabella's character. Mind you, I read the manga and then watched the anime too of Paradise Kiss, but the transphobia was on 10 in the manga and it made me uncomfortable and i was talking to a few trans people and they told me that that shit made them uncomfortable just as well so i really do regret not speaking up more about the issues that paradise kids had with transphobia over there so here i told myself i am not going to hold back on how i feel about so many of the issues within neighborhood story because there's issues with anti-blackness there's issues with homophobia and when i thought the homophobia wasn't going to come back it came fucking back and it was annoying there's a lot of issues with writing 
but also there's just so many kind of weird instances of like kind of misogyny in it just as well so here we go the Haryana Hook neighborhood story video this is something that's been long awaited but we're here now So as you guys know that when it comes to like one of my major goals that I had this year for my content, I really wanted to focus on the subject of women and cartoons. Like when I say cartoons, I mean comics, mangas, mangas, animation, all of that jazz. That's why I was very hesitant on how I wanted to go about with this video because I personally feel like I is always a person that a lot of people just don't have anything negative to say about. And I get it, I understand that because of all the positives that she has done for women and femme presenting people that really like art and whatnot. But as a black woman, and as a black woman who has numerous friends that are gay, trans, or gender non-conforming, it's just certain aspects with her storytelling that just kind of frustrate me a lot but also i noticed that there are some aspects of her work where it shines the most and then there's some aspects of it where it just falls flat and it's just very frustrating to deal with so what exactly is neighborhood story neighborhood story follows the life of a good girl named mikako I uh, keep getting her name fixed up with her sister who is in Paradise Kiss named Miwako. But Mikako, she basically is a very eccentric girl and it's just about her life, her friends, the people that she interacts with, and the school that she goes to which is an art school. Is it a performing art school or is it just an art school? I don't know but it's a school for the arts basically and we get to meet all of her friends we get to meet the people that she likes she we get to meet the people that she don't like but basically so much of it is kind of like the love story between her and tomoroki i always don't know how to pronounce his name let me look because i really didn't care enough about him because that's just one funny thing i had with neighborhood story mikako is this very interesting character and her you know boyfriend because in the beginning it doesn't start them off with being boyfriend and girlfriend but he becomes her boyfriend later on as the story goes on and he's just so fucking uninteresting like he is so damn boring like i'm just not I just wasn't. It was really hard for me to read the scenes where it would just be him and Mikako if they weren't fucking fighting because they fought a lot in the story and it was annoying as hell but he was just so boring to me. He was just so fucking uninteresting and I really enjoy Mikako's character outside of him. And that is where I think the story shines the most when it comes to neighborhood story but Remember, I've never seen Nana in full because the pink one annoyed me so fucking bad. But then this was also something that I've noticed within my I was doing cosplay. That's fake blood on my finger. But also when I was reading and watching Paradise Kiss, I noticed that I was very much interested in these characters more when it was just them as people and their careers and their interests and whatnot outside of their damn relationships. Now here with Mikako, she wants to be a fashion designer. Her dealing with the stuff that has to do with fashion is 10 times more interesting for me than it is with the stuff going on with her and that dude. I need to figure out how to pronounce his name. That's how you know I didn't care about him because I dead ass did not even care enough to, you know, learn how to pronounce his name correctly. That's how much I didn't give a fuck. Satomu? Satomu? How do you say Satomu? I'm pretty sure it's Satomu. I, I, either or, I didn't care about him. He wasn't all that fucking interesting to me. But we are introduced to Satomu and a girl named Mariko. And they also call her Bodyco. Now, ooh, this girl, Girl Failure University, all right? Basically, Mariko has interest in, I forgot how to say, damn, that's how much I just don't care about that dude. But basically, boyfriend she liked him at first she dated him for a while but then when she realized that yeah he likes Mikako he's not gonna deal with her she ends up starting to pursue another guy within their friend group which is named Akendo basically that's the group that they have together at their school where they make like 
arts and crafts and shit like that. Yeah, she ends up starting to pursue another guy named Yusuke, but Yusuke is stuck on another girl named Ayumi. Now, Ayumi and Yusuke's entire thing is just Mariko trying to figure out if she wants to figure out if she wants to be with Yusuke or not. But I have so many problems when it comes to Mariko's character. And who, 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 who. first of all, oh god there's so many problems with this story and i just like don't know where to begin with them but i want to sit here and tell you guys the rundown of the story first before i get into a lot of the technical issues with it but it's just kind of hard to say that because there's so much that goes on within this book and it just feels like a repeat of, of unfortunate events. Because I mentioned on one of my Goodreads reviews that I read for one of the books, I'm pretty sure it was book four. I basically said that this was the most annoying book to read yet because it just really felt like a recycled of the last four or three novels like it was just really frustrating to read because it kind of feels like the same thing is just happening over and over and over again and I felt like that too when it came to Paradise Kiss just as well it was like okay the same events happening over and over in place but that is just so much of what neighborhood story is Mukako and her boyfriend fight Okay, Yusuke and Mariko fight, and Yumi is somehow in the mix, and repents, okay. Pai Chan, we're gonna get into her, because ooh, I hate what this story did to her. She basically gets treated like ass by the story in general. Mm -hmm. Jairo barely does anything in the fucking story. He's just there and looks cool with his mohawk. Risa is just, whew. And then Centauro is just there. Now I have a fat ass problem with Centauro because of his hair. I hate that shit. I fucking hate that shit. But moving forward with that, there's an entire fashion show. Miwako wins the award of the school. She gets a, stand, a chance to study abroad to London. The main reason she doesn't want to go is for her boyfriend. Note to self, do not literally turn down any opportunity for a dude. I'm sorry. No, absolutely fucking not. Um, Somebody comes to live with Mikako. They call him the sparkling foreigner. Mind y'all, don't call people foreigners, please. And yeah, she goes to London. Um, Miwako's mother, who treats Miwako more like a sister than an actual parent. She's not that great of a parent too. And funny because the little sister here, Miwako basically said that their parents were not all that great. What did that shit tell you right there? It ends with that and she goes to London, studies abroad. Risa, who I can't fucking stand. Y'all give her too much dupe on her chip because I went into the story liking Risa and then I realized she wasn't that great of a person. Risa has a son who ended up being an old a brutalizing person because we can't say the actual A word over here in Paradise Kiss, but I'm starting to see why her son was such a horrible person because she is not a good mother to him. Her son did not respect her, but she also was not that great of a parent to his ass either. And then that's just kind of how like neighborhood stories end. It was just a series of unfortunate events about Miwako's life. Shit happens where she meets her dad again. And I think that's one of the highlights of the story when it's not dealing with fucking romance. She meets her dad again. She basically has a sale. They have like a little pop-up shop. You know how you had the pop-up shops and they went to a little flea market and Mikako did not sell shit when it came to her clothes, but she was able to sell a bag. We see a lot of her ups and downs when it comes to her fashion designing and what she wants to do with her life and whatever we see the kinds of dynamics that she has with her friends and her classmates and whatever so much of this story is extremely strong when it does not focus on the subject of romance because romance honestly is the downfall for a lot of these characters especially Marco. so now that you guys have like the rundown over neighborhood story i just I told myself that I really could not do a full on structured video with this because I still am very conflicted on how I feel about this story. I one don't think it was bad. Like I've, I've read much worse. And two, I don't think it was all that great either. Because there's just so many little small issues within here that just kind of create an overall big problem. But I say like the biggest issue here is that it's something that I've noticed when it comes to Ayazawa's work in general. Mind you, I never read Nana in full. 
like I said, because the pink one got on my nerves so much. And I read Paradise Kiss too, but now I'm sitting here reading Neighborhood Story. I think this might be one of the last Ayazawa stories I would want to read because I've noticed that there is just kind of like this ongoing pattern with this kind of storytelling. I noticed that Ayazawa does not seem to see value in the characters that aren't really in relationships. The characters that are not dating anybody or are not with anybody, they are the ones that are just kind of like pushed off to the side and seen as like supporting to everybody else. Because while Mariko is basically a side supporting character, she's still seen as more important than I say Pichon. Why do I keep calling her Pichon? It's Paichon. Justice for Pai Chan. Ooh, this story. Ooh, she does that better. But Pai Chan and the other people at the school, they seem to be seen more in the background where so much of Mariko and Yusuke and Ayumi's relationship was like pushed towards the frontward. But I noticed that there was this big issue. It really stood out with the character name Pai Chan. Her name is Mai, but they call her Pai Chan within the story. And now Pai is one of Miwako's like closest friends, childhood friends, I say like that. And she's super duper sweet. She honestly was my favorite character because you want to know why? She was the only person in this fucking story that didn't get on my nerves, like ever at all. She was so sweet. She was such a saint. I really wish that we got to see more with her, but she wasn't really interested in dating for the most part. And this is leads into something else that I have like a problem with because this can low-key be seen as ace phobic to a certain extent because I noticed the characters that really aren't interested in dating or being with anybody for the most part when it comes to the works they can be like read to be ace I'd say like I said it can be read to be ace I'm not saying that they are because we do see that Pai Chan is interested in dating but if she has like a very specific type of dude that she wants to want to be with but other than that it's just everything else is like so so to her she just simply doesn't give a fuck and I love that about her she doesn't center men within her life and that's a problem that a lot of these female characters within neighborhood stories seem to have they all seem to center niggas in their life and that's something that always gets on my nerves mind you I am somebody I grew up never really centering dudes in my life okay never did like when I was like younger I did but when I realized I just have so much great to live for and to go through with that that's just not worth my time and that is what led to me not really liking the character by the name of Risa. Now Risa a lot of people are kind of familiar with her because her son is literally the worst person ever in Paradise Kiss which is the sequel to Neighborhood Story. Now I know a lot of people say that you don't need to watch or read neighborhood story before reading Paradise Kiss but I'm gonna be honest Paradise Kiss really did affect my opinions on numerous characters in neighborhood story it affected my opinion on Mikako for sure because I personally don't think Mikako was a good sister but also I noticed that Mikako followed a lot of her mother's behaviors which she did pertaining to her daughter and her little sister Miwako. Because Mikako and Miwako's mother, she's not that great of a parent. She sees her daughters more as sisters, as friends, opposed to seeing them as her children. And she expects them to do things for her. She expects them to take care of her. She expects them to cook for her or whatever. So she is just a very frustrating ass woman. But that is something else that's another problem that we're gonna leave a pin on because it's something I noticed with the overall issue that I had here in Neighborhood Story but I also fucking had in Paradise Kiss just as well. So moving forward back with Pai Chan, I wanted to see more of her. I wanted to know more about her because she really was interested in making plushies and toys and things like that. She really was interested in you know the subject of fashion design and all of that jazz. She was a very interesting character but because she most definitely wasn't interested in dating she just kind of was like so so and like pushed to the back and also it just kind of frustrated me how the story like treated her to be like so childish and so immature compared to her peers because you remember that point that I just told you to put a pin on but something else that I noticed is a big problem Ayazawa in my opinion I feel like needs to just write adult characters because I noticed when she writes a lot of these teen characters right here she writes them as if they're in college 
Like, I often got confused when I was reading Neighborhood Story because I was like, oh my God, there's this high school. I kept thinking that this was university. I kept thinking that this was college because the entire story treated them like they were in university. And that was another issue that I had with fucking Paradise Kiss too just as well i kept forgetting how old these characters were because the way they were written they were low-key written as if they were older because i'll give like one example for it when it comes to mariko mariko basically stays in her own apartment yeah she's 17 like she basically stays in her own apartment and then the group often comes over akindo they often come over and they would work in her apartment before they ended up moving to another space but there's instances like that. Literally, Miwako goes to the fucking bar. Like, she doesn't drink alcohol or anything like that. But she goes to, like, this bar area. There's so many instances of just them just going places and not telling their parents where they're going. They kind of talk to their parents weird. Because the way that Mikako and her mother talked, I was just like... It's like they're doing all this shit where they're acting as if they're, like, college-age students. Acting as if they're between the ages of, like, 18 and, like, 21. And then we're zoomed back in time. Like, no, they're still in high school this is literally a performing arts high school that we're at is it performing arts or is it just arts i don't fucking know pai chan i really liked her character and i really wish we got to see her more but there was something else like something else weird that happened within this story too with her character was where why is the story trying to act like she's big like take a look at pai chan she's not big because there's a part in here where she was like yeah there's a lot of clothes that don't fit me so i have to alter them to my size and i'm like you're skinny. If Miwako is a size zero, zero, you're just a zero. Like, huh? And there also is like some other like fat phobia things up in here too, where Risa was complaining about how like she gained weight and whatnot. And that's normal at that age. I remember in high school when girls would be complaining about gaining weight and whatnot. I said that is a bit normal at that age, but it was a little frustrating seeing how Pai Chan was made out to be like the big one, like the duff of the group, when most definitely no, that is not the fucking case. Ew. So I feel like now is like a good time to go ahead and go into to like a lot of the other like kind of weird things that were like in the story there are a lot of these outfit choices that the characters were in like i said sometimes this story makes you forget how old these characters are some of these outfit choices i'd say are a little bit too much for them especially if there is this one drawing of mikako that i really don't think should have been in here and it is like a drawing Okay, y'all know that pose where like women would like stand over to the side and like bend over? Cause I have a picture like that in one of my cosplays like on my Instagram. It's like when I did my Audrey Bourgeois cosplay. She's basically doing that, but it's like worse because her ass is like towards the audience. And I'm just like, okay. But there's just so many instances like that where like shit like that is written up in here. And I'm just like, okay, this character is how old now? We don't need to see this. It's Loki giving Sam Levison. Like, can we not? Ooh. But aside from that, there's just other kind of like odd things up in here because there's nudity in here. There was nudity in Paradise Kiss too. But because Paradise Kiss was like Jose, it was a lot more detailed over there too. But here we see Mariko's ass. Like her ass is literally like, that's like a whole ass shot in here. And I'm just like, so it's just a lot of situations like that where I'm just like, <sighs> But moving forward, like I said, we're talking more of like the social issue aspect of it. I don't want to forget about this thing. I'm sorry this video is all over the place, y'all. It's just, I just need to get how I feel about this story off my chest. I really want to talk a little bit more about Risa's character because I feel like I didn't necessarily explain why I didn't like her so much. Mind you, I like Risa from the beginning, but the more I read the story, she reminds me of a lot of girls that I didn't like growing up and a lot of women that I still kind of like don't like in this day and age still. She kind of gives like pick me to a certain extent because she literally does everything and anything for the sake of her boyfriend. Mind you, he's like three years fucking older than her. Mind you, it depends on what the three years is. She ran away with this dude when she was like 14 and he was like 17. Uh, yeah, no, 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 no. Now mind you, the story portrays that shit like it's cute. It's not like, ugh, it's gross. But that's not the reason why I dislike Risa. Completely not. That is not the reason whatsoever why I didn't like her. I personally didn't really like Risa all that much because I don't think she was that great of an influence on me 
Kako. I really don't think she was a good influence on her. That is why I got so frustrated at times where Mikako will always run to Risa for everything instead of Paichan who was there and just very much understanding. And I feel like that has to do with the fact that Mikako saw Risa as a little bit more air quote grown up and matured than Paichan too just as well. But I personally think Paichan was a better friend to Mikako than Risa because Mind you, throughout the story with Risa, I was like getting kind of frustrated with her here and there and whatever because she was like trying to portray herself as she was like better than everybody and she was grown compared to everybody because she ran away from home and all that shit and whatever. But it's like we see that she's like a good friend to Mikako. She's supposed to be seen as Mikako's right hand woman, the one that's always there for her on her side and whatnot. But she was one of the people that wasn't really all that encouraging for her when Mikako had the opportunity to go to London. Because mind you, Risa had gotten the opportunity to go to London too, but Risa turned it down. And you wanna know why? She stayed for her stank ass boyfriend. That's why she didn't go. And basically she was kind of encouraging Mikako not to go just as well. Mind you, if my friend got the opportunity of a lifetime to go study abroad, I would be very much encouraging of them. I would be telling them to go and take that damn opportunity. I wouldn't be sitting here and trying to discourage them and tell them to go. Mind you, Mikako was very much here for it at first. She really wanted to go, but she didn't start to change her mind until Risa's influence because Risa was over here like, um, I'm not gonna go because I want to be with my boyfriend and they were just looking at her like okay whatever but Mikako she didn't start to think that until she heard Risa say that and then Risa even told her basically that she wasn't independent enough to go on her own and mind you that is just kind of what studying abroad does for you you get to learn to be a little bit more independent and whatnot so I really just did not like I honestly wasn't feeling her that much throughout the story for the most part mainly because of some little sidebar comments that she would make here and there that I'm about to mention later but when I realized that she was low-key a hater in the entire situation of when Mikako got the opportunity to go to London, mind you, she got it too. She was very much discouraging of her to go. So that shit right there. I am not team Risa. A lot of people like Risa. I, I don't. I'm mad because I had picked up Neighborhood Story in the beginning of this year. I picked it up the beginning of this year at the end of like 2022 and I'm like okay Reese is cool I like her yada 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 but when I've actually picked the story back up for the sake of me actually wanting to make a video on it I she's actually one of the, story, the characters that I dislike the most and I hate that shit like ugh it's sad because she really could not see herself out of that dude and I'm just like baby get up we're better than this and then also another thing that frustrated me because at the end of the neighborhood story we get to see a flash forward of what it's like with her being a mother and whatnot and she's not a good mother but honestly it's not surprising seeing that all of this was going on and it really sits here and it makes me think how that dude was treating her because fast forward over to paradise kiss we see her son's name Arashi, and he's literally despicable i fucking hate him he's literally so terrible he's literally one of the most unlikable characters in paradise kiss but it literally sits here and it makes me think about risa it makes me think about what kind of parent she is but it also makes me think about what kind of parent her husband is too just as well but when i did get to see how she treated her son she literally fucking kicked him upside the head and the way he spoke to her was very off-putting like why would you speak to your mother like that but the way she allowed him to speak to her and the way she spoke to him back I was just like yeah I don't like you I don't like you <sighs> now we need to get into the homophobic shit okay this story has like some issues with homophobia but also remember this is a 90s manga are we shocked no Disappointed still, yes. Now, there is like one small instance of homophobia in the beginning, in the first book, where basically this dude made it seem like it was a negative thing if Mikako was into girls. Like, that should annoy me. And that literally made me put the story down for a while because it was just so fucking irritating. But I was like, remember, it's a product of its time. And then I kept reading it. Remember her the product of his time that doesn't give an excuse. So I kept reading it. And then when Pai Chan was over here talking about how she's not really necessarily interested in dating and her dream guy is a guy that wears tights. 
Oh, Jesus. Mikako and Reese's response to that was very fucking rude. So we have that instance there. And then we end up meeting me kako's mother's assistant who basically it is confirmed that he is gay at the end of the story and i really don't like the way the, the story handled that shit too Woo! okay his name's seji his mother's assistant and he ends up becoming good friends with miwako now it's cool for the most part whatever but then later on when it is revealed that Seji is not interested in girls and that he's gay, he like basically like tries to like, he basically like tries to hold Mikako's boyfriend hand and it's obvious that the dude looks very much uncomfortable. Oh God, I'm just like, okay, okay. That's just one kind of negative connotation that gets on my fucking nerves when it comes to the subject of gay people. Like, just because they gay don't mean they want your ass, okay? Like, that's just something that pisses me off so bad. Because I remember when I was in high school, when people would be like, oh, that person gay, I don't want to be around them because you're using that there. I'm like, baby, just because they gay don't mean they want your ass, okay? So it basically was like that impression of like, oh, he's gay that means he's interested in anybody that's male i'm just like oh no okay so we move forward with that and then the more stuff with seji basically pai chan finds him to be very very cute she thinks he's cute and basically miwako and her boyfriend basically tell her oh girl like mind you miwako thinks he's an alien <laughs> it's funny up until it wasn't. Miwako thinks he's an alien, but her boyfriend knows what's up and was like, oh, he's gay. And Miwako was like, oh no, he's an alien. And what pisses me off so bad about this is that Miwako made it seem as if it was a bad thing if Seji was gay. Like, mind you, it's not a bad thing that Seji's gay, period. But she was trying to make it seem like her boyfriend was being rude, calling him gay. She was like, oh my God, don't call him that. Don't you, da -da -da. and I'm just like, Ooh, the homophobia in the scene is on 10. And mind you, when her boyfriend found out that Seji was gay, he was like, okay, I no longer have to be worried about you trying to come on to Mikako because he was jealous of Seji for a lot of the story because he felt as if like Mikako was gonna leave him for him. But after that, he basically says some shit talking about, yeah, I don't have to worry about him coming up, coming on to you, but I gotta worry about him coming on to me. And I'm just like, oh. Oh, ah, homophobia is on 10 here. Okay. It's annoying. It's frustrating. But I'm not surprised because like I said, Paradise Kiss had a trans character in there, but there was so much transphobia that surrounded her character and it frustrated me so fucking much. It's no surprise that the gay character here in Neighborhood Story has so much homophobia surrounding them. But then again, it's even outside of that because there was homophobic shit said in the story before. So moving forward, now that we're done talking about the shit with like the homophobia and like the not really seeing themselves outside of men in the storytelling and whatnot, we got to talk about the anti-blackness in this story because as I told you guys when I posted on my community tab that I wanted to make a video about neighborhood story. But when I saw this picture right here, I literally had to pause for a second because I was like, what the actual fuck is that? What the fuck is that? So somebody had tried to tell me to exp like explaining it, trying to like, you know, like, oh, it's not what you think. And here, they basically were saying that, mind you, if you're watching this, whoever left that comment, I'm not upset with you whatsoever. But it really just points a finger to like the bigger issue here at stake. So basically they're like, oh, Ayazawa basically like sees herself as a monkey and that's basically her inserting herself in the story. And I was like, all right. And in the story, Miwako often called her boyfriend a monkey. Like she often called him a monkey and stuff like that. But when it comes to this photo, 
you put a monkey on an afro and mind you that monkeys are something that is always like you're seen as derogatory when it comes to black people or darker skinned people of color with very much ethnic non eurocentric features for you to put an afro on a monkey is offensive whether you want to defend that or not because there's just so much horrible history with black people being written off as like you know apes and chimps and monkeys and shit like that so it's still wrong it's still distasteful and it also doesn't make up for the fact that it says afromania on the shirt just as well i know ayazawa probably didn't mean for this to come off as anti-black but it was like that picture just really put like a bad taste in my mouth and oftentimes i try to sit and i try to like be a little bit more understanding like yeah she probably didn't know but mind you when it comes to a lot of these manga artists and these people that work within anime and all of that shit it's kind of hard to tell if they really meant something negatively or they didn't mean it like that because we really don't know much of anything about these people we don't know their views their thoughts and opinions because i'm trying to remember it was a youtuber I was watching that basically said something talking about it's kind of hard to tell if we should be looking at certain things in anime with nuance or not because we don't necessarily know the views of the people that are creating it I personally don't know how Ayazawa feels about black people so I'm not gonna sit here and flat out say that this woman is anti-black or racist for the most part absolutely not but there is issues with anti-blackness within the story and this monkey picture shows it. While she may not have meant for this picture to be offensive, it is. The amount of people of color and non-black people of color specifically, and there were white people too just in, as well in that comment section talking about how disturbing that picture was. I understand that we do things and we may say things that may come off as offensive like the entire situation that happened when i made the video about nimona when y'all told me i was wrong i didn't know i was wrong at first but when y'all told me i was wrong i was like oh i'm sorry i apologize and i took the video down as i should because i fucked up right there in that moment but here i'm just like she probably didn't realize it was wrong but at the end of the day it's still wrong and all of these people have very valid critiques about why this picture makes them very uncomfortable because it's giving menstrual show emotion definitely is giving menstrual show speaking of menstrual show there is a character in this shit that runs around with a fucking dreadlock wig on okay it's mariko's little brother so basically one of the members in a kendo named shintaro he runs around with like this dreadlock wig on and mind you the characters are not the nicest when they see this wig on his head mind you i had to pause for a moment when i saw this shit because i was just like okay all right Ooh. okay basically mariko basically looked at her brother and was like what the fuck is on your head and he was like, oh, I think it's cool. But then when they got to school, people were still like, what is that shit on your head? And, oh, God. Can we not be rude about ethnic hairstyles? Like, first of all, he shouldn't have been wearing the damn wig in the first place. But now we have people over here being rude about this hairstyle. Locks. Very ethnic hairstyle and then Miwako says something rude about the hair too just as well and I'm just like girl I want to root for you but you keep doing insensitive shit <sighs> more of you for the most part Shintaro's character he's not he falls into the same category as Paichan not really a person that's interested in dating and whatnot but more interested in arts and crafts and all of that shit and because of that he is seen as less than in this universe of Ayaz always works he's not all that important he's just thrown to the back he's not all that big he's also there as like Mariko's sister and she's low-key embarrassed by her little brother or whatever and that's basically kind of like so much of what his character is he's just an annoying little brother but he didn't really start to feel air quote important into the story until Mariko left and stopped going to school and started skipping class and all of that shit. Mind you, Marco acted like she was grown. Why was she living on her own in the first place? Like, ugh. And then also, there's like this weird ass like statue of like a monkey that is made. I don't know what that thing is. I screenshotted it. I don't know what that shit is. And it has locks and it doesn't make it any better that Shintaro, that Muako's boyfriend, Shin took a picture of Shintaru and that thing together and they're like doing like a monkey pose or something and I'm just like ah, I hate this 
for the most part, Neighborhood Story is a story that I personally felt like was all over the place. It, it, it was a joy ride, I'll tell you that. It's a wild ride. But even though I did enjoy Neighborhood Story to a certain extent, this goes into that category of things that I cannot ethically recommend. Because I low-key don't even ethically recommend Paradise Kiss anymore just as well. Because of the issues that I saw here translate over there. Mind y'all, I don't want y'all to take away from this video that I'm being an Ayazawa hater. Because that's not the case. I will be the first person to tell you that I take a lot of inspiration from her when it comes to my works and whatnot. I think she's a very talented woman. I think she has done a lot when it comes to like the sake of Jose and women and working in cartoons and animation and all of that but there is just things that I just can't overlook because of my family my race all of that jazz I'm just like ugh. I'm honestly kind of upset because I really expected to like Neighborhood Story a lot more but after how uncomfortable I felt with Paradise Kiss, mind you I did like Paradise Kiss but it has so many fucking problems and I see that a lot of these issues were put up in Neighborhood Story just as well, I was like yeah this is a pattern. And mind you, people often ask me, can you watch Nana? Can you make a video about Nana, this and that and the third? One of the reasons why, first of all, I tried reading Nana when I was in high school, didn't like it, tried to read it again, but the pink one pissed me off so bad, so I just told myself no. After reading Paradise Kiss in full and then watching the anime too, and then after reading Neighborhood Story, mainly I read the manga because the anime was not fully adapted. I think I'm good on oh, Nana. I think I'm good. I think I've had enough of Yaya's always works. I see the good that is here when it comes to storytelling to a certain extent. The looks are amazing. They be serving here just as well. But her works just... I am in no way shape or form saying that she is a horrible creator whatsoever. But I... Neighborhood Story and then Paradise Kiss have put bad taste in my mouth when it comes to certain things relating to like social issues and whatnot. It's frustrating and like I said I really don't even know how I feel about Neighborhood Story to begin with because like I said I don't think it was bad but I also don't think it was good either. Do I think it's mid to a certain extent? Maybe. We might be throwing it in the mid category but there was just so much missed potential with this series. There were just so many things that I wish I could have seen a little bit more of. There were a lot of things I wish I saw a lot less of within it. It really could have dealt without the homophobic shit. It really could have dealt without the anti-black shit too. And I try to sit here and not like let small little things like that bother me but they were just so prominent in the story because they kept coming in and out on occasion and it was just kind of frustrating to deal with like I said I know this is a lot of you guys's introduction to neighborhood story I know plenty of you guys have never read it before and I know that it is going to start becoming accessible in English because they're going to adapt the first manga soon and put it out in American audiences. The ones I was reading was basically like a translation that some very kind people had put online. I don't want you guys to not want to give this story a chance or I as I was work a chance simply because I'm just kind of over it and not really feeling it all that much okay. This is your life. You can make your own decisions. You can form your own thoughts and opinions on that. But these are just my opinions on neighborhood story and I think this will be my last eyes all story for sure it's my last ah, mm. thank you guys so much for watching um today has been a really long day i've been busy like working and running around and taking pictures and whatever i'm just tired i'm tired y'all okay I am exhausted, I am drained, but thank you guys so much for watching this video. I don't want to take this makeup off like, I don't want to take this look off, it is so cute. The wig, the the gems, it's super cute, I love it so much. And then like I also did like the brow lip liner on top of like glitter gloss and I'm like it's super cute. I love it, I'm here for this shit, I'm most definitely here for that. 
um well, I'm on my Instagram, I'm gonna be doing Blacktober. This cosplay is gonna go on there in October. I have some other art and cool things going over there just as well. Also, um, Patreon, I have that. If you guys want to support the channel, completely optional. What else do I got going on? Book, yeah, all of that. Yeah, all right, I'm gonna shut up now. And this video has gone on way too long, so yeah, goodbye. Thank you guys so much for watching and have a good day, night, or whatever time of the day you chose to watch this. I'm just glad you watched it with the ads on. Okay, thank you. Goodbye. Now, now that you see, you should be aware of the power of three. They come to fight as fast as they can. They're dangerous, yet fabulous. Because the Utonia made them is true. They are the colors of pink, green, and blue. They'll catch you in the blink of an eye and do it all before bedtime. They come in through and fighting oh. And everyone they shocking oh. You know no one can stop them All because of the chemical oh. acts They come in through and fighting through. And everyone they shocking You know no one can stop them All because of the Yes.